Professor Robert George holds Princeton's celebrated McCormick Chair in Jurisprudence and is the founding director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. He served as chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and before that on the President's Council on Bioethics and as a presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He has also served on UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics, Scientific, Scientific Knowledge and Technology, of which he continues to be a corresponding member. He's a former Judicial Fellow at the Supreme Court of the United States, where he received the Justice Tom C. Clark Award. He's the author of In Defense of Natural Law, Making Men Mortal, or excuse me, Moral, both, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and Public Morality, The Clash of Orthodoxies, Law, Religion and Morality in Crisis, Conscience and Its Enemies, Confronting the Dogmas of Liberal, liberal Secularism, and co-author of Embryo, A Defense of Human Life, Body, Self-Dualism in Contemporary Ethics, What is Marriage, Men, Women, a Definition, and a number of other works. He's a recipient of many honors and awards, including the Presidential Citizens Model, the Honorific Medal of the Defense of Human Rights of the Republic of Poland, the Canterbury Medal of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and the list goes on and on. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and holds an honor honorary doctorates of law, ethics, science, letters, divinity, civil law, humane letters, and uh, uh, juridical science. And one of those honorary degrees comes from BYU. He's a graduate of Swarthmore College and Harvard Law School. He received a master's in theology from Harvard and a doctorate in philosophy of law from Oxford University. Professor George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, so much. And thanks to all of you for coming out, Richard and uh, Emily. Uh, Wheatley family, uh, I want you to know that I know what it means that you would give me that. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. And I want you to know how much I appreciate it. I always feel when I come to BYU as if I'm coming home, uh, never more than today. Well, this is a celebratory occasion, and I want to congratulate everybody who has been associated with the Wheatley Institution and has built it into such a powerful force uh, for the family and civil society, not only here at BYU, uh, but throughout the academic uh, world. Uh, special congratulations and thanks to Jack and Charles Wheatley and the Wheatley family. I salute you uh, on what you have made possible uh, at this institution. Uh, Richard and uh, Emily, you've done it. Uh, my hat is off to you. I know a bit about what goes into building uh, an institution like this. I was the founder of one called the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, uh, and you guys have really done it. I also want to say a special word of thanks to two distinguished uh, friends who have uh, come along. My old pal, Judge Tom Griffiths from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and my old friend, uh, President Holland, uh, Matt Holland. Is it President Holland or Senator? It, President Holland. Sorry, sorry pre <laughs> President. President Holland. And of course, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the presence of uh, uh, Judge Griffiths, I'm tempted to begin this lecture by saying, may it please the court. <laughs> Those of us who are citizens of liberal democratic polities don't refer to those who govern us as rulers, do we? You don't hear us talking that way, not in a democracy. It's our boast that we rule ourselves. And there is truth in this in as much as we participate in choosing those who do rule us. So we prefer to speak of them 
not as our rulers, but as servants, public servants, or people in public service. You'll hear politicians uh, at any level of government uh, say, well, in my 27 years of public service. Now, of course, these so-called servants are nothing remotely like the servants in, say, Downton Abbey or upstairs, downstairs. The extraordinary prestige and usually the trappings attaching to public office in just about all times and all places would by themselves be sufficient to distinguish, say, the governor of Utah or a United States senator or the president of the United States from Carson the butler. But that prestige signals an underlying fact that discomfits our democratic and egalitarian sensibilities, namely the fact that even in liberal democratic polities, high public officials are rulers. They make rules. They make the rules. They enforce them they resolve disputes about their meaning and application. To a very large extent, at the end of the day, what they say goes. Now, of course, our rulers in democratic regimes rule not by dint of sheer power, the way the mafia might do in a territory over which it happens to have gained control, but rather our rulers rule lawfully. Constitutional rules specify public offices and settle procedures for filling those offices. Whether the Constitution exists in the form of a specific document, such as the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or Virginia, or in some other unwritten form, as in the United Kingdom or New Zealand, either way, the Constitution, capital C or small c, constitutes, in a sense, the set of rules governing the rulers, rules that both empower office holders to make and execute decisions of various sorts and also limits their powers. So though they are rulers, our rulers are not absolute rulers, constitutional rules set the scope and thus the limits of their jurisdiction and authority, whether it's a governor or a senator or a sheriff, their authority is limited. They are rulers who are subject to rules, rules they do not themselves make or by themselves make and cannot easily or purely or on their own initiative revise or repeal. They rule in limited ways and ordinarily for limited terms, which may or may not be indefinitely renewable at the pleasure of the voters. They rule by virtue of democratic processes by which they come to hold office. And they can be removed or significantly disempowered at the next election if the people are not happy with them. Still, for all that, they rule. Now, my point here with you this afternoon is not to hoot at the idea of government and those holding governmental offices and controlling the levers of governmental power as servants. I don't want to laugh at that idea. On the contrary, I want in the end to defend the idea that rulers can at the same time be servants and should be. I want to establish, however, at the beginning that if these people we call public servants are indeed servants, as well as rulers, they are servants in a very special sense, a sense that is compatible with them at the same time being rulers. They are people who serve by ruling, people who serve us by ruling. They serve us well by ruling well. If they rule badly, they serve us poorly. They disserve us. Now, there are, of course, lots of ways that rulers can disserve those whom they have a moral obligation to serve by ruling well. 
Most obviously, there is incompetence. There's plenty of that in government, always has been, always will be. Then, of course, there is corruption. History knows a bit of that, too. And in the extreme, there is tyranny. So what does it mean for the ruler to truly be a servant? What does it mean for someone holding political office and exercising public power to rule well? Well, at the most basic level, abstractly, it means making and executing decisions for the sake of the common good, not for the sake of any individual interest that the ruler happens to have, not for the sake of the ruler's group or clan or tribe or family or class, but for the common good. Such decisions will necessarily be compatible with the requirements of justice, and at the same time, they will embody justice. If we understand the concept of the common good properly, and I'm going to say a word about that in a moment, then we will see that no decision that violates a requirement of justice, any requirement of justice, even the smallest, can truly be for the common good. And no decision that genuinely upholds and serves the common good will fail to advance the cause of justice. I'll explain that in a moment. Now, it's also important to note that decisions can fail to serve the common good and can indeed damage the common good even when they are not unjust. All unjust decisions violate the common good. I'll explain that in a moment, as I say. But not all decisions that violate the common good are unjust. Not all decisions violate the common good because they're unjust. There are other ways that decisions can violate the common good. Even honorably motivated and well-intentioned rulers, or people generally, can make decisions that harm the common good, that damage the common good, because those decisions are inexpedient or imprudent or unwise. Holders of public office, like anyone else, can make poor, even disastrous decisions, even when acting on the purest and best of motives. Poor decisions by well-intentioned public officials can, for example, trigger or prolong a Great Depression. Such decisions can lead a nation into an unnecessary or even disastrous war, or prevent a nation from going to war to protect its people and their vital interests when it should have done. Such decisions can undermine or weaken the marriage culture and with it family life and everything in a society that depends on the health, health and vibrancy of marriage and the family. Now it's worth adding here that even reasonable people of goodwill can and do disagree, often disagree, about what the common good requires and forbids, what is in truth just and unjust. Even the great moral decisions are not always between the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys can get the big decisions wrong. And the good guys can argue with the good guys about what is in fact right. Honorable people exercising public power can commit injustices, even grave injustices, while seeking in good faith to do justice and believing in good faith that they are doing it. So just as not all violations of the common good are injustices, not all injustices are the result of malice or ill will or like vices. Still, all injustices, even if committed by officials who are sincerely trying to do the right thing, harm the common good. For justice is itself a common good. It's a good each of us has in common. Each of us has a stake in living in a just society. It is good for each of us to live in a just society. So justice is itself a common good, and it is a central aspect. Indeed, the classic philosophers tell us it's the form of the common good of the political community. It is to the benefit of each and every citizen to live in a just social order. It makes you better off as a person, as a citizen, to live in a just social order. And harm to that order is therefore a loss for everyone and not merely for the immediate and obvious victims of any particular injustice. 
Indeed, it is even a loss for the ostensible beneficiaries of injustices, and indeed, even for the perpetrators of injustice, though naturally, true evildoers, the true bad guys, don't see it that way. Corruption of character narrows their vision of the good, blinding them to the profound respects in which wrongdoing harms what is in truth their interests as much as anyone else's in living in a just society. Now, the common good requires, among other things, that there be rulers and that the rulers actually rule. I generally agree with what James Madison says, but there is one comment he makes uh, in Federalist, I believe it's number 10, Tom, that I think isn't quite right. He says, in a society of angels, government would not be necessary. I don't think that's actually right. Because the point of law and government is not simply to restrain evildoers or evil doing. It is also to coordinate human behavior for the sake of collective goals that cannot be achieved by consensus, but have to be achieved by the exercise of authority. Even sometimes just as a matter of practicalities. We can't all get together and design the traffic pattern system. Somebody exercises authority for the sake of the common good who does that so that we can transport ourselves and goods safely on the highways to the benefit of our own health and to the benefit of the economy, for example. So the common good requires, and will always require, that there be rulers and that they actually rule. And to grasp this is to begin to see the sense in which good rulers really are also servants. Members of societies face a range, sometimes a vast range, of challenges and opportunities requiring both means to ends and persons to persons coordination, including in the case of complex societies like ours, coordination problems presented by the large number and the complexity of other coordination problems. Now, since uh, by coordination problems, I mean problems like establishing the traffic pattern. Now, since such problems cannot, as a practical matter, be addressed and resolved by unanimity, authority, political authority, law, is required. Institutions will have to be created and maintained, and persons will need to be installed in the offices of those institutions to make the choices and decisions that must be made and to do the things that need to be done for the sake of protecting public health, safety, and morals, upholding the rights and dignity of individuals, families, and non-governmental entities of various descriptions, and advancing the overall common good. That's what rulers are supposed to do. Rulers ruling through law are supposed to accomplish those goods that are common goods for all of us. And this would be true even in a society of perfect saints where no one ever sought more than his fair share from the common stock or violated the rights of others or deliberately acted in any way, manner that was contrary to the common good in Madison's Society of Angels. Even in such a society, effective coordination for the sake of common goals and thus for the good of all would be required in seeking unanimity, assuming a large and fairly complex society that can't do everything in a New England town meeting just wouldn't be a practical option. So authority is required. And that means persons exercising authority, rulers ruling. But the moral justification for the ruler's ruling is service to the good of all, to the common good. And it's really important to understand, and for our young people to understand, that the common good is not just some platonic abstraction. It's not an abstract thing hovering out there in some transcendental realm. No. The common good is just the concrete well-being, the flourishing, of flesh and blood persons constituting a community. A community that is served by laws that do uphold public health, safety, and morals, protect the rights of individual persons, and advance the overall public interest. It just is, the common good just is the well-being of those persons and of the families and other associations of persons, what Edmund Burke called the little platoons of civil society, of which individuals and families are members. The right of legitimate rulers to rule is rooted in the duty of rulers to rule 
in the interest of all. In, order, in other words, the basis of the right to rule is the duty to serve. And the realities that constitute the content of service are the various elements of the common good. By doing what is for the common good and by avoiding doing anything that harms or undermines the common good, rulers fulfill their obligations to the people over whom they exercise authority, thus serving their interests, their welfare, their flourishing, in a word, serving them. Now, uh, let me just pause here to uh, say that when we think of service to the common good and of obligations to the common good, we rightly think in the first instance of the obligations of rulers to enact just laws, to rule well, and so forth. But we mustn't forget that all of us as persons, as individuals, not just rulers, have obligations to the common good, and certainly obligations not to undermine the common good. It's a mistake to think of the common good as a concept that applies only to the exercise of political authority. Political authority is such an important thing with respect to the common good that it's almost natural to make that mistake, but we mustn't do it. The pornographer, the private individual who spews that stuff into the culture, having the corrupting effects that we see now, the social harms that no longer can be denied, is not a public official, he's not a ruler, but he's nevertheless damaging the common good, violating an obligation that all of us have to respect and uphold and not damage the common good. And that's just one example of countless examples we could think of. Now, I don't know how to improve on the definition of the common good proposed by my own doctoral supervisor in Oxford, Professor uh, John Finnis, in his magisterial book, Natural Law and Natural Rights, which uh, Oxford published originally in 1980 and is now out in a second edition. The common good, Finnis says, is to be understood as, quote, and uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some emphasis on some words, note the emphasis for later. Here's Finnis. The common good is, quote, a set of conditions which enables the members of a community to attain for themselves reasonable objectives or to realize reasonably for themselves the value or values for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate with each other positively and or negatively in a community, unquote. And by positively or negatively, all Finnis means is by either coordinating to work together or coordinating to stay out of each other's way so you're not blocking something that uh, uh, another person uh, is doing to contribute something to the common good. Now, every community from the basic community of a family to the community of a church or other community of religious faith, to a mutual aid society or other civic association, to a business firm, will have a common good. The common good is the set of goods, the set of values, the set of ends for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate positively or negatively together. The common good of some communities is fundamentally an intrinsic good rather than an instrumental good. That's true, for example, of the community of the family. Although families serve many valuable and some indispensable instrumental purposes, getting the babies diapered and fed, getting the children off to school, keeping them out of trouble and so forth, families serve many valuable instrumental purposes. The point of the family, the marriage-based family, this most fundamental institution of society, is not exhausted by those instrumental purposes, nor do they define what a family is. The most fundamental point of being a member of the family is simply being a member of the family, enjoying the intrinsic, as opposed to instrumental, the intrinsic benefit of being part of that distinctive, irreplaceable, non-reproducible network of mutual obligation, care, love, and support. That's why we think it's good to send the baby home with his own mom and dad and not with another couple, even if we think the other couple is going to provide, all things considered, a better home, or at least a better education, or more money, or any other instrumental benefit. Now, the same is true in the Christian and Jewish traditions of thought, at least, of the common good of the community of faith. Though communities of faith characteristically serve many valuable instrumental purposes, think of all the 
of the social welfare services that the, that the LDS church or the Catholic church or the Lutheran church or the Jewish community uh, provides and so forth and, and all the fun we have at socials and all the stuff we do uh, together as communities of faith that's instrumental in its value, all that instrumental value doesn't exhaust the point of being the church or being, for Jews, the people of Israel. The most fundamental purpose of Israel, or the church, is to be the people of God, to be Israel, to be the church. But notice that things are obviously different when it comes to, say, a business firm. And this is not to denigrate business firms. It's just to note the difference between those institutions or communities whose common good is an intrinsic good, fundamentally, and those whose common good is fundamentally an instrumental good. Although there are ordinarily many opportunities for principals or employees of companies to realize intrinsic human uh, goods, basic human goods, in their interactions and collaborations together in pursuit of the firm's objectives, they can establish friendships, they can cry on each other's shoulders, they can s celebrate each other's joys and, and bear each other's sorrows and so forth. All of that's intrinsically good. The point, though, of the business firm isn't that stuff, and you close the firm when it isn't accomplishing this other thing, which is to produce products or provide services that remunerate the principles to the, of the firm and provide employment and so forth. So businesses, business firms are more fundamentally means than, say, families are and churches are. And when they come and go, the loss is not the loss of something intrinsically valuable. Now, of course, that raises the obvious question. You can see where this is going. What about the common good of the political community? Is it fundamentally an intrinsic good, like the church or the family, or is it fundamentally an instrumental good, like the business firm? Well, there is in what Sir Isaiah Berlin, uh, the late Sir Isaiah Berlin, referred to as the central tradition of Western thought about morality, including political morality a powerful current of belief that the common good of political society is indeed an intrinsic good, that it's like the church or it's like the um, family. This seems clearly to have been the view of Aristotle, and many self-identified followers of St. Thomas Aquinas are firmly convinced that it was the view of Aristotle's greatest interpreter and expositor, namely St. Thomas Aquinas. Professor Finnis, however, argues that the common good of political society, though, to quote Aristotle, great and godlike, in its range and importance, is nevertheless fundamentally an instrumental and not an intrinsic good. And he further argues that the instrumental nature of the common good of political society entails limitations of the legitimate scope of governmental authority, limitations that, though not in every case easily articulable in the language of rights, are nevertheless requirements of justice. Now, although I have a difference at the margins uh, with my uh, mentor, Professor Finnis, on this, on the question of what just those, uh, what those, uh, of just what those limits are, I agree with him that the common good of political society is fundamentally an instrumental good, and that this entails moral limits on justified governmental power. Now, that does not mean we shouldn't be patriotic. Yes, we should be patriotic. It doesn't mean we should, shouldn't have a love of country. We should have a love of country. It's not about whether the common good of the political society is very, very important. Obviously, it's very, very important. So is the common good of a business firm. But it's just that it's on the instrumental good side of the line rather than the intrinsic good side of the line. And that has implications for the limits of governmental power. Now, the way we have come to think of these limits is in terms of what nowadays is called the doctrine of subsidiarity. Eighty years ago, a Catholic pope, Pope Pius XI, in an encyclical letter, letter uh, entitled Quadragesimo Anno, it's, this is 1931, explained the basic idea, and here it is. Quote, just as it is wrong to withdraw from the individual and commit to a group what private initiative and effort can accomplish, so too it is wrong for a larger and higher association to arrogate to itself functions which can be performed efficiently by smaller and lower associations. This is a fixed, unchanged, and most weighty principle of moral philosophy. Of its very nature, the true aim of all social activity should be to help 
members of a social body and never to absorb or destroy them. Now this principle of justice called subsidiarity and this idea of the common good reflects a particular understanding of the nature and content of human flourishing. And that is that flourishing consists in doing things, in activity. Jonathan, are you here, Jonathan Pike? We were talking about this in the car on the way from the airport. Flourishing does not consist just in getting stuff or having things done for you or having pleasant experiences, which you might get on Valium for all I know, or being plugged into the late philosopher Robert Nozick's famous imaginary experience machine or something like that. That's not human flourishing. Human flourishing consists in activities, in doing things. Human goods are realized by acting. One participates in them. Thus enriching one's life and even ennobling oneself as one exercises and fulfills one's natural human capacities. For example, one's capacity for friendship or for the deepening of knowledge or for the acquisition and development of skills as in chess or ballet or football uh, or in one's development of the powers of critical artistic appreciation or in a range of other areas. But all of those are things people benefit from by doing, not just by experiencing or having things done for you or having things given to you. And so the common good is, as Finnis remarked, best conceived as a set of conditions. But we must ask conditions for what? Well, let's recall that definition from Finnis that I gave you a few minutes ago, emphasizing some points. Conditions for enabling members of a community to attain for themselves reasonable objectives, or to realize reasonably for themselves the values for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate with each other in community. So the common good is in this sense, the common good of the political community is in this sense facilitative. Its elements are what enable people to do things individually and in cooperation with others, the doing of which to a significant degree constitutes their all-round or integral flourishing. Under favoring conditions, people can more fully and more successfully carry out reasonable projects, pursue reasonable objectives, and thus participate in human goods, in values, including some values that are inherently social, friendships, marriages, inherently social goods, in that they fulfill persons in respect of capacities for non-instrumental forms of interpersonal communion deepening of relationships that are indeed constitutive of their integral well-being and fulfillment. Properly understood then, the common good requires as a matter of justice limited government. That's what the for themselves entails. Government that is that respects the needs and rights of people to pursue objectives and realize goods to the extent possible for themselves. The fundamental role of legitimate government and thus the responsibility of legitimate rulers, rulers who serve, is not to be doing things for people that they could do for themselves. That's a direct violation of subsidiarity. It is rather to be helping to establish and maintain conditions that favor, favor people's doing for themselves and with and for each other. More on that in a moment. Government should do things for people as opposed to letting them do things for themselves. Where but only where individuals and non-governmental institutions of civil society, Burke's little platoons, cannot do them or cannot reasonably be expected to do them for themselves. Finnish used the word enable and it's exactly the right word here. Government's legitimate concern is with the establishment and maintenance of conditions under which members of a community are enabled to pursue the projects and goals by and through which they participate in the human goods constitutive of their flourishing. Now this facilitative concept of the common good does not require doctrinaire libertarianism, either in the domain of political economy or social morality. I think it's a kind of abuse to read it that way. 
but it clearly excludes corporatist and socialist policies that, to recall those words from, Paul, from Pius XI, I'll quote him again, withdraw from the individual and commit to the group what private individual, a private individual effort can accomplish. Or, to put it in my own language, which remove from the family or the religious or civic association and commit to government at higher and higher levels what can be accomplished by non-governmental collaborative effort and often, especially in the area of social welfare, can be accomplished so much better. Why did both Pro Vice President Gore and President Bush advocate the faith-based initiative? The experiment never got tried, <laughs> if you remember back to, the, uh, to, to 2000. But if you remember back to 2000, you'll remember that the one thing the two candidates in the 2000 election, Gore and Bush, agreed on was we need a faith-based initiative. You know what the motive for that was? It's they looked out at the world, they saw government social welfare programs failing and failing and failing, making the situation of the people they were supposed to serve worse and worse and worse. They look over at the institutions of religion and they work. And so the question was, could you make it, could you scale it up by making it a private partner, private public partnership. So government could at least make available without discrimination on fair terms of competition, contracts for the provision of social services to any potential provider, including religious ones, where we're not gonna discriminate against religious ones because they're religious. We're not gonna give them an advantage over secular ones. We're not going to discriminate. Unfortunately, as I say, the experiment never got tried because the whole thing blew up over other uh, issues which we could talk about. Surely a conception of the common good that is serious about the principle of subsidiarity will respect private property and take care to maintain a reasonably free system of economic exchange, that is to say, a market economy. So-called social ownership of the means of production, that is, comprehensive or very widespread state ownership of the means of production is clearly incompatible with subsidiaries' concerns and objectives, as is anything resembling what Hayek called a command economy. And this would be true even if the record of socialist states were benign when it comes to respect for civil liberties and political freedom, which on the whole it certainly is not. And it would be true, even if, again, contrary to the historical record, private property and the market economy were not necessary as checks against the excessive concentration and abuse of power in the hands of public officials. But as I've noted, the historical record demonstrates that private property in the market system, while not sufficient as guarantees against the concentration and abuse of power, you know, you can look at China, you can look at the way capitalism sometimes degenerates into crony capitalism. So, still, for all intents and purposes, private property and the market economy are necessary as conditions for the preservation of civil liberty and limited government. And there's a profound lesson in this for those of us who are interested in ensuring that rulers remain servants, that is, rulers who rule in the interests of citizens and don't reduce themselves uh, uh, or reduce citizens to a condition of dependency and servitude. For it's critical to the effective limitation of governmental power that there be substantial non-governmental centers of power in society. And this is what the Wheatley Institution uh, is so centrally concerned with. Because you know what the very first of those institutions is? It's the family, the marriage-based family. That's the fundamental cell of civil society. And private property and the market economy not only provide the conditions of social mobility, which is important to the common good in any modern or dynamic society, but also ensure that there are significant resources and thus opportunities for people in the private associations they form that are not in the control of governmental officials or the apparatus of the state. This diffusion of power benefits society as a whole and not only those who immediately benefit economically from the possession of property or the ability to profit from the market. And I'm not simply here talking about general prosperity, though that is yet another benefit of private property in the market system. I'm talking about the benefit to all in terms of liberty, 
opportunity and security, especially against the depredations of government, of the diffusion of power. If you have studied authoritarian regimes, and especially if you have studied totalitarian regimes, you will see how the concentration of power makes it impossible for people, for civil society, to defend itself against the central state the Stalin, the Hitler, the Pol Pot, the tyrant. And this all goes well beyond economics, by the way. If we understand the common good, if we have a grasp of what constitutes it, what's conducive to human flourishing and what's not, we recognize that limited government is also important because it permits the functioning and flourishing of non-governmental institutions of civil society, the little platoons, that really do perform, and perform better in most instances than government ever could, the most essential, the most basic health, education, and welfare functions, and which play the primary role in transmitting to each new generation the virtues without which free societies cannot survive. What are those? Basic honesty, integrity, self-restraint, concern for others, respect for the dignity and rights of other people and not just yourself, civic-mindedness, and the like. Government can't produce that. The economy can't produce that. The legal system, even with great leaders, great jurists like Judge Griffith, can't produce that. If we do get, if we're fortunate enough to get people on the whole, at least a lot of people who have basic honesty, integrity, self-restraint, concern for others, respect for their dignity, civic mindedness, who's going to produce it? The family, which is why what Wheatley does is so critically important. We lose the family. It's not just a loss for the family or for the church. It's a loss for every institution of civil society. It's a loss for the institutions of democratic governance when you do not have people who are fit for the rule of law, who lack the basic traits and habits and virtues necessary to be successful people and decent, honorable citizens the whole system begins to collapse, which is why our society's carelessness, carelessness about the fate of the family is so infuriating and perplexing. What do they think they're going to get? Decent people to compose a society, to run the institutions they do care about if you let the family go down the tubes. This is a nightmare, and we cannot give up which again is why it's so important for Wheatley to be doing what it's doing. Now, uh, I'm going to return to the role of these institutions uh, of civil society here in a little bit, but now I want to shift the discussion to the question of constitutional structural, constraint, structural constraints on the powers of government. Now, historically, political theorists have focused on the need for constitutional restraints on power as the most obvious and important way to ensure that governmental power remains limited and that rulers serve the people and don't become tyrants. This is what Federalist Number 10 is all about, what the whole Madisonian system of checks and balances and the Federalist system and so forth are all about. And I myself think that constraints of this nature are important in this cause, though I am going to get around to saying in a minute uh, that they are likely to be effective, these structural constraints, only when they are part of a larger picture in which they are supported by and in turn support other features of social life that help keep government power within its proper bounds for the sake of the common good. So as important as they are, I would warn against, I would warn you against placing too great an emphasis on constitutional limits on power. And that's because the danger there is in ignoring other essential features. Now this is not my usual line. So when I'm at home in Princeton, I'm teaching my constitutional interpretation courses, I'm there always putting the accent because my students come to uh, the university seemingly not knowing about this. Uh, it's no seemingly to it. They come not knowing about this. Uh, so there I put the accent on, you got to understand why the framers were so keen to have constitutional constraints, structural constraints on power. Why they didn't just want a, you know, a king or uh, a, a benign despot why they wanted power. They didn't want anybody to have too much power. But today, because I think you guys all understand that, I'm going to say a little about it. But really, my reminder here is, it's not enough. There's other stuff that's got to be in place 
or the structural constraints won't even work. Now, the Constitution of the United States and it's, is famous for its Madisonian system of constraints on the power of the central government. More than 200 years of experience with that system gives us a pretty good perspective on both its strengths and weaknesses, or limitations, not weaknesses, more limitations. The major constraints are these. One, the doctrine of the general government, the central government, the national government, what we call the federal government, as a government of delegated and enumerated and therefore limited powers. Number two, the dual sovereignty of the general government and the states, with the states functioning as governments of general jurisdiction, exercising police powers, a kind of plenary authority, limited under the Constitution only by specific prohibitions or by the grants of power to the central government in a federal union. And three, the separation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers within the national government creating the so-called system of checks and balances that limits the power of any one branch and, it is hoped, improves the quality of government by making the legislative and policy-making processes more challenging, slower, and more deliberative. And then, of course, four, there's the practice, nowhere expressly authorized in the Constitution itself, but lay that aside for the moment, of constitutional judicial review by uh, the federal courts. Now, I often ask my students at the beginning of my undergraduate course on civil liberties how the framers of the Constitution sought to preserve liberty and, pre and prevent tyranny. How was the Constitution supposed to do that, I ask them. And it is, alas, a testament to the generally poor quality of civic education in the United States that almost none of the students, when they enter my classroom, never having before studied civil liberties or constitutional law, can give a good answer to that question. And these are brilliant. So they're all valedictorians and almost perfect SAT. Many of them have perfect SATs. And so these are brilliant kids. Not their fault. They don't know how to answer the question. The editors of the New York Times couldn't answer the question. I doubt that most members of Congress, frankly, could answer the question. But let me tell you what the typical answer is, whether it's from my students or the editors of the New York Times or I suspect most members of Cong Congress. Well, here's what my students say. Oh, well, Professor, I can tell you how the framers of the Constitution sought to protect liberty and prevent tyranny. They attached to the Constitution a Bill of Rights to protect the individual and minorities against the tyranny of the majority. And they vested the power to enforce those rights in the hands of judges who serve for life and are not subject to election or recall, who can't be removed from office except on impeachment for serious misconduct, and who are therefore able to protect the people's rights without fear of political retaliation. Now this is about as wrong as it can get. But it's widely believed, and as I say, not just by university students. None of the American founders, of whom I'm aware, even among those who favored judicial review and regarded it as implicit in the Constitution, such as Alexander Hamilton, which not all did, none of them believed that judicial review, based on the Bill of Rights, or more broadly, was going to be the central or even a very significant constraint upon the power of the national government. That's not what was supposed to be the bulwark for liberty and against tyranny. Nor did they believe that the enforcement of the Bill of Rights by the courts would be an important way of respecting or protecting liberty. The Federalists, in the original sense of those who supported the proposed Constitution, not the party that arose shortly thereafter, but the original Federalists generally opposed the Bill of Rights, the addition of a Bill of Rights. My students are shocked when they hear this, but it's true. Hamilton, for example, very popular guy these days, opposed the Bill of Rights, right there in the Federalist Papers, you can look it up, because they feared it would actually undermine what they regarded as the main constraint, or set of constraints, protecting freedom and preventing tyranny. Namely, one, the conception and public understanding of the general government, the national government, not as a government of general jurisdiction, but as a government of delegated and enumerated powers. And two, the division of powers between the national government and the states in a system of dual sovereignty where state power was not merely derivative of national power. When political necessity forced the Federalists to yield to demands for a Bill of Rights in the form of the, in the, form of the first eight amendments to the Constitution to get the Constitution ratified, they took care to add two more amendments, the ninth and tenth, 
designed to reinforce the delegated powers doctrine and the federalism principles that they feared would be obscured or weakened by the inclusion of a Bill of Rights. Now, as for the way judicial review has functioned as a structural constraint in American history, suffice it to say that the practice has given Oxford University legal and political philosopher Jeremy Waldron, who's an old and dear friend of mine and a fierce critic of judicial review, plenty of ammo in making his case that he goes around the world making against permitting judges to invalidate legislation on constitutional grounds. So when he goes back to his native New Zealand, which doesn't have judicial review, but where some people are arguing they should have it, he will warn them this is a mistake. The federal courts and the Supreme Court in particular have had their glory moments to be sure, such as the racial desegregation case of Brown against the Board of Education in the 1950s. But they've also handed down decisions from Dred Scott against Sanford in the 1850s, which facilitated the expansion of slavery, to Lochner against New York in 1905, which struck down basic worker protection legislation in the states, uh, to Roe versus Wade, which invalidated the abortion laws in 1973, in which they have plainly overstepped the bounds of their own authority and without any warrant in the text, logic, structure, or original understanding of the Constitution, simply impose their own personal moral and political opinions on the entire nation under the pretext of enforcing constitutional guarantees. The latest important case of that is the same-sex marriage decision in Obergefell. Chief Justice John Roberts was as blunt as he could be about, and he was absolutely right. If you're celebrating this because you, like, you, you think same-sex marriage is a great thing, celebrate, but don't pretend this has anything to do with the Constitution. These usurpations are, quite apart from whatever one's views happen to be on slavery or labor legislation or abortion or marriage, a stain on the courts and a disgrace to the constitutional system, bringing it into disrepute and undermining its basic democratic republican principles. Moreover, since the 1930s, the courts have done very little indeed by way of exercising the power of judicial review to support the other constitutional structural constraints on the exercise of central governmental power. A very small number of isolated decisions have struck down this or that specific piece of federal legislation as exceeding the delegated powers of the national government or trenching upon the reserved powers of the states, but that is about it. Now, one of the dangers of judicial review in general is that its practice does, as Waldron points out when he makes the case against it around the world, it tends to encourage belief among legislators and worse still, among the citizens more broadly, just ordinary people like us. It tends to, it tends to educate them or miseducating, miseducate them into believing that the constitutionality of proposed legislation is not a concern of the people's elected representatives. It's only a concern of the courts. If a proposed piece of legislation is unconstitutional, you'll hear, people, you'll hear legislators and others say, then it's up to the courts to strike it down. One of the things that drives me crazy, one of the things that uh, makes my wife worry that I really am going to pull an Elvis and shoot the TV set, is when I'm watching C-SPAN. I don't know why I watch C-SPAN, but I do watch C-SPAN. And there will be two senators or two representatives in an otherwise empty legislative uh, chamber, and they're having an argument about some piece of legislation. Uh, and they'll argue this and they'll argue that. And then finally, the opponent of the legislation will say, well, whatever you say about the value or importance of this legislation your party or you are, or, uh, are uh, proposing, it's unconstitutional. And the supporter of the legislation will say, well, that's not for us, up to us. That's up to the courts to decide. We're just supposed to pass this legislation and the courts will tell us whether it's constitutional or not. But this is a complete travesty for the structural constraints to accomplish what they're meant to accomplish, for them to constrain the power of government as they're meant to do. The question of the constitutionality of legislation in light of those constraints is everybody's business. Judges exercising judicial review, yes, we're not going to put Judge Griffith out of work, but also legislators, Warren Hatch and, and, and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and 
whatever Republican is representing Utah now. <laughs> it's their job too. And you know whose job it is besides theirs? Ours. We should be concerned about the constitutionality of legislation. We should be acting as citizens on our elected representatives on the basis of our constitutional judgments. We should be debating these constitutional issues and not saying they are the province of the court. They're not. And that brings me to the critical yet oddly neglected subject of political culture and the related, critically related subject of civic virtue. I mentioned Professor Waldron earlier. Now, a few years ago, he was back in New Zealand to read his countrymen the Riot Act about what he condemned as the abysmal quality of that nation's parliamentary debate. The bulk of his lecture was devoted to an analysis and critique of a range of factors leading to the impoverishment of legislative deliberation, warranting the stinging title he assigned to his lecture, Parliamentary Recklessness. He offered a thoroughly gloomy appraisal of the quality of parliamentary debate in New Zealand. But instead of ending his lecture uh, on a downer, he offered some grounds for hope. He concluded by saying, or pointing to the possibility, that the deficiencies of parliamentary debate that he had identified might be at least partially compensated for by a higher quality of public debate even hinted that a higher quality of public debate could prompt the reforms necessary in Parliament to at least begin restoring the integrity of debate within the parliamentary chamber. But he also warned that things could go the other way, and the warning is as much to us as it is to the people of New Zealand. The corruption of parliamentary debate, the corruption of politics, could inf at the legislative level, could infect the political culture at large, driving public debate down to the condition a parliamentary debate, and we are seeing this in our country today. He uh, described the condition himself uh, in the parliament in uh, language that uh, I, I find uh, quite relevant to what we have today here. He said, quote, parliament becomes a place where the governing party thinks it has won a great victory when debate is closed down and measures are pushed through under urgency, and the social and political forum generally becomes a place where the greatest victory is drowning out your opponent with the noise you can bring to bear, and the premium then is on name calling, on who can ball the loudest, who can most readily trivialize an opponent's position, who can succeed in embarrassing or shaming or if need be blackmailing into silence anyone who holds a different view. Isn't that what we see today? Isn't that what we see today? You try to defend the institution of marriage, you try to defend the idea of marriage as a union of man and woman, what do you get? You're a bigot, you're a hater. The name calling, the shaming, the attempt to stigmatize, frighten you, intimidate you out of speaking your mind. So in a sense, it is up to the people to decide, people of New Zealand and people of the United States, to decide whether we will rise above the corruption that has demeaned legislative politics or permit it to infect the political culture at large. And remember, the people, are not some undifferentiated mass. They are people, you and me, individuals. Now, of course, considered as isolated actors, there's not a lot that any of us as an individual can do to affect political culture. But individuals can cooperate for greater effectiveness in prosecuting an agenda of conservation or reform, and they can create associations and institutions that are capable of making a difference. A critical element of any discussion of the quality of democratic deliberation and decision making that amounts to anything more than hot air will be the indispensable role of non-governmental institutions of civil society, those little platoons yet again, in sustaining a culture in which political institutions do what they are established to do, do it well, or at least reasonably well, and don't do what they are not authorized to do. It's got to be civil society that holds the political class in check, that makes the demands on the political class that they stay within the constitutionally prescribed lines. The Constitution will not enforce itself, and we can't simply rely on judges to enforce it. 
Often they'll get it wrong. Sometimes it'll be beyond their capability to enforce it, even constitutionally. But it's not beyond ours. And it's going to be civil society, ourselves, and the organizations and institutions we form that keeps the political culture healthy, that keeps the political class within the lines. And so we must be mindful that bad behavior on the part of political institutions, which means bad behavior on the part of people who exercise power as holders of public office, can weaken, enervate, and even, yes, corrupt the institutions of civil society, rendering them for all intents and purposes impotent to resist the bad behavior and useless to the cause of reform. Overreaching government is very good at basically commandeering and instrumentalizing, buying off or intimidating, and even corrupting the institutions of civil society. We, as the people who constitute civil society and its institutions, have to be the guarantors of the health, the purity of those institutions. Now my point, and this is why I promise to return uh, at the end to the importance of civil society, is that this is true generally, and, not, uh, and it's certainly true with respect to the bad behavior of public officials who betray their obligations to serve by transgressing the bounds of their political authority and the limits embodied in the doctrine of subsidiarity. Constitutional constraints are important, but they will be effective only where they are effectually supported by the people, that is, by the political culture. If our students don't even know, if our young men and women don't even know how the Constitution works, if they don't even know the, the system of constitutional structural constraints, don't expect those constraints to work. Don't expect the political class to respect those constraints, to limit their own powers, restrain themselves to stay within the lines. That's not how reality works. The people need to understand them and value them, and value them enough to resist usurpations by their rulers even when unconstitutional programs offer immediate gratifications or the relief of urgent problems. This in turn requires certain virtues, strengths of character among the people. But these virtues don't just fall down from the heavens on us. They have to be transmitted through the generations and nurtured by each generation. In a sentence I do agree with, Madison famously said that only a well-educated people can permanently be a free people. Boy, that is absolutely true. Only a permanently well-educated people. You can get the best constitution in the world. I mean the idea, the platonic form of a constitution. If you have an ignorant people, an ignorant, a people who are ignorant of their own civic uh, institutions and principles, that constitution is going to be worthless. Nino Scalia, before he died, the great Justice Scalia, used to uh, go around asking people if they've read the Soviet const the constitution of the old Soviet Union. And if they hadn't, he'd tell them about it. Fantastic constitution. You want freedom of speech? It's in there. Freedom of religion? Absolutely, it's in there. But life in the Soviet <laughs> Union, for you young folks, I know this was the Middle Ages, 1990, uh, life in the Soviet Union didn't conform to what it said on the page of the Soviet Constitution. So we need to transmit to people civic understanding and the virtues they need to live under a constitution of liberty. And that goes beyond simply teaching civics better in schools, though that would be a good thing. And, and Emily, I'm glad you're on it. We need it, but it's not enough. Now, the Constitution, our Constitution, was famously defended by Madison in uh, the 51st Federalist Paper as, quote, supplying by opposite and rival interests uh, the defect of better motives. You remember that, man. He made this point, though, immediately after observing that the first task of government is to control the governed, and the second is to control itself. He allowed that a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, I'm quoting, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. Hence the system of constitutional structural constraints, among other things. But even in this formulation, they don't stand alone. Indeed, they are presented, you notice the structural constraints are presented as, presented as secondary 
auxiliary. What's also necessary and indeed primary is a healthy and vibrant political culture, a dependence on the people, as Madison put it, to keep the rulers in line. And that brings us back finally to the role of virtue. John Adams understood as well as anyone the general theory of the Constitution. He was the ablest political theorist of the founding generation. He doesn't get credit for that. Everybody thinks it was Jefferson. Jefferson was the great political thinker. Uh, I say it was Adams. I'm an Adams man. Uh, Adams had a perfectly good understanding of, of why Jefferson got the credit and he didn't, as Adams put it. Uh, uh, I, he said, Adams said, I am obnoxious and short. <laughs> Jefferson is tall and lovable. <laughs> and Adams certainly got the point about supplying the defect of better motives. Yet he also understood that the moral health of political culture was an indispensable element of the success of the constitutional enterprise, an enterprise of ensuring that rulers stay within the bounds of their legitimate authority. That's why Adams remarked that our Constitution, quote, is made for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Now, why would he say that? I mean, it scandalizes my colleagues when they hear, you know, my liberal academic colleagues, when they hear Adams saying that. I mean, it's the G word, right? Religious people, uh, God. Because people lacking, and here's the reason, it's because people lacking in virtue could be counted on, always can be counted on, to trade liberty for protection, for financial or personal security, for comfort, for being looked after, for being taken care of, for having their problems solved quickly. And there will always be people occupying or standing for public office who will be happy to offer the deal, an expansion of their power in return for you giving up your liberty. So the question finally is how to form people fitted out with the virtues, making them worthy of freedom and capable of preserving constitutionally limited government, even in the face of strong temptations, which will inevitably come to compromise it away in depressions, in wars, in natural disasters, in social chaos. And here we see the central political role and significance of the most basic institutions of civil society, the marriage-based family, the religious community, private organizations such as the Campfire Girls, I used to say Boy Scouts, that are devoted to the inculcation of knowledge and virtue, private, often religiously-based educational institutions, and the like that are in the business of transmitting essential virtues. These are indeed, as is often said, mediating institutions that provide a buffer between the individual and the power of the central state. It is ultimately the autonomy, integrity, and general flourishing of these institutions, these little platoons, that will determine the fate of constitutionally limited government. And this is not only because of their primary and indispensable role in transmitting virtues, so that's true. It's also because their performance of health education and welfare functions is the only real alternative to the complete removal of those functions to larger and higher associations, that is to ever higher levels of government. When government expands to play the primary role in performing these functions, the ideal of limited government is soon lost no matter how wonderful the formal structural constraints of the Constitution are. And the corresponding weakening of the status and authority of these institutions damages their ability, the ability of the family, the ability of the church, the ability of the other private associations to perform their functions, including their moral and pedagogical ones. With that, they surely lose the capacity to influence for good the political culture, which at the end of the day is the whole shooting match when it comes to whether the ruler can truly be a servant. Thank you.